Hi, uh, I'd like to start if you don't mind. Uh, so, so, hello, my name is Alexander Lisey, and I'd like to thank you all for coming to my presentation. I'm going to talk about my experience writing a Type 2 hypervisor for FreeBSD, which works on the ARMv8.0 architecture, and which I've called have 64 I'll talk about the challenges I faced along the way, and my solutions to those, to those challenges. Today I'm going to focus on CPU memory virtualization, but I've also been able to, been able to virtualize the interrupt control and system timer, make it possible, making it possible for PH164 to run a free BSD guest. I have a bachelor's degree in computer science from University Politecnica of Bucharest, that's in Romania. I've graduated last summer, and this project, PH164, was the subject of my bachelor's thesis. I split the presentation into several sections. I'll start with an overview of the project, where I'll talk about the current state of the project and what motivated me to work on behalf of 64. Then I'll move on to how the CPU was virtualized in order to trick the guest operating system into thinking it's the only operating system running on the, on the CPU, when uh, in fact, there's also the host running on the same CPU, and the host is uh, controlling what, uh, what the guest is able to execute. Then I'll move on to memory virtualization, which, means, which basically means the same thing as CPU virtualization, tricking the guest into thinking it has access and can control the entire memory address, memory address space, when in fact the guest, uh, the host is the one that uh, configures the guest, the guest to only have access to a specific memory region. p 64 is still a work in progress, and I'll talk about, I'll also talk about my, uh, the plans I have for the future of, uh, of the project. And I'll finish the presentation with uh, a demo of running a FreeBSD guest under DH164. So like I said, I'll start an overview of the project. I'll, uh, I'll present what works and what still doesn't, and also present the motivation behind the project. I'll also explain how a user can create, run, and destroy a virtual machine using DH164. So DH164 is a type 2 hypervisor for FreeBSD which implements the virtualization model present on the ARMv 8.0a architecture. It's based on Beehive for ACD6 and ARMv7, but it is not yet integrated with the FreeBSD kernel. Beehive 64 is able to run a FreeBSD virtual machine on the Foundation Platform Simulator. The Foundation Platform Simulator is a simulator offered by ARM, uh, which simulates the ARMv8 architecture. It can be downloaded from uh, the ARM from ARM's website, there's a link there to, uh, to the page. A virtual machine can use memory mapped VertIO for accessing a network, to accessing server network and block devices. p 64 has its limitations. There's no SMP support for a virtual machine, meaning that a virtual machine can only create one virtual CPU for the guest operating system running inside, uh, running inside the virtual machine. And also, BH164 hasn't been tested on real hardware yet. So, what motivated me to write the hypervisor for ARM CPUs? Uh, the main reason behind this is that ARM wants to enter the server market where virtualization is widely used. I'll present a few accomplishments in this area that lead me to believe that ARM is making real prog progress in this area. So last year, Amazon launched EC2 instances based on Graviton CPUs. Graviton CPUs are custom designed ARM CPUs, loosely based on the Cortex A72 design, and this is a design which dates from uh, 2015. More recently, ARM launched the Neoverse family of CPUs. <laughs> Neoverse CPUs are designed and targeted at the server market, much like the Cortex CPUs are targeted at the mobile market. The M1 CPU is the server counterpart to the Cortex A76 CPU, which is present in the Snapdragon 855 CPU and in Windows and in newer models of Windows and ARM laptops. Also last year, Cavium launched the Thunder X2 CPU. The CPU is based on the ARM, ARM V8 0.1 architecture. 
A paper has been written benchmarking this CPU against the latest Intel offerings, latest Intel server offerings, at least at, least at that time. And the authors conclude that uh, Thunder X2 CPUs have a similar performance as Intel, while offering a better price to performance ratio. p 64 has the same components as p 486 or p 44 rmd 7 The hypervisor is implemented as a kernel module called VMM. The user uses previous space programs to control a virtual machine. Behind load is used <coughs> to create a virtual machine. Behind will start a virtual machine created with Behind load. And Behind control is used to destroy the virtual machine. Each virtual machine is uniquely identified by a special device entry under dev VMM. The user space programs use library functions implemented in lib VMM API. And these, fu these functions serve as wrapper of, uh, over IO coupled calls which are issued to that special device which identifies the virtual machine. Uh, I'll talk more about each of the user space program, each of the user space program programs that the user uses to, man to manage a virtual machine. So first, the user will invoke Behive Load. Behive Load is used to create a virtual machine. So the user can specify the memory layout for that the, uh, the guest running inside, in, inside the virtual machine uh, will see. It can specify the, mem the memory base address using the dash p enough and the memory size. The user also specifies the kernel memory that will be copied inside the, the virtual machine and the load address for this kernel image. So this is how uh, the host uh, configures the virtual machine. But the guest running inside the virtual machine is to get, get, get this information from somewhere. <coughs> this information is specified by using a device tree, fly, device tree file. This device tree file is static compiled in the kernel image that is loaded. At the moment, uh, we have load cannot generate this, uh, uh, this device tree file dynamically based, based on the arguments given to it. And so the arguments given to behind load and the device tree file must match. And finally, the guest specified the virtual specified the virtual machine name, which will be used to create that special device entry under the VMF. So after we have finishes executing, the virtual machine is created, but is not yet run. In order to run a virtual machine, we use the behind command. Uh, the first two parameters uh, in the example uh, specify vert IO devices. We have NCC4 uses memory mapped vert IO. Uh, the vert device is a block device backed on the host by the file vert IO.img, and the second is a, a vert IO net device. Uh, the user can also specify to use the BVM console, <coughs> to use the BVM console as the system console for the virtual machine. Uh, BVM console is a development console and has been deprecated on x86 as far as I know. I'll talk more about how BVM console works because it's an inter interesting case to study about how virtualization works. Then the user can use BVM control to terminate the virtual machine. Terminating a virtual machine means releasing all the resources associated with that machine uh, including the special device entry under dev VMM. Uh, I'll move on to how sorry. I'll move on to how I've implemented I've implemented CPU virtualization, meaning tricking the case operating system that is the only operating system running on the CPU. So when I started started working sorry. When I started working on the project, uh, the, fir the first thing I had to do was how to implement a way to make sure that the host is always in control over the, over the guest and over the, the hardware. This was needed in order to respect Popek and Goldberg's safety requirement for virtualization, which states that uh, exactly that, that the host must always control the guest and not vice versa. 
In order to do this, I, I use a special CPU execution mode called, called Exception Level 2, or EL2 for short. So EL2 is part of the ARM virtualization extensions, and it, uh, it is a CPU execution mode, which was designed to be used specifically by a uh, hypervisor when doing virtualizations. This new CPU execution mode has the same general purpose, general purpose registers as the rest of the CPU execution modes. It has uh, the CPU execution mode EL1 where the kernel executes and EL0 uh, where the user space executes. But on top of that, it has a different virtual address space than EL0 and EL1. And it also has new system registers which control the execution of code at EL2. But what interests, interests us the most is the system registers, which are implemented and then to control the execution of software at EL0 and EL1. I mean, this means that they control the execution of a, of a guest operating system. Unfortunately, EL2 has some limitations in ARMv 8.0. Most of these limitation ha limitations have been addressed in RV 8.1, but, uh, but we have RCC4 at the moment only targets RV 8.0. So uh, these limitations come in the context of, uh, of us wanting to execute the host at the same CPU execution, execution mode as, uh, as the hypervisor. We want to execute the, the host at, at EL2 because this is the CPU execution mode designed specifically for virtualization. So the first difference is that EL2 has different register names than EL1. Than EL1. The second difference is that it has a virtual address space that cannot be shared with user space. The can usually shares a part of his address space with the user space. And also all synchronous exceptions like page fault are rooted by the hardware in a, in a normal situation to EL1 and not EL2. So if we wanted to run FreeBSD as the host as EL2, at this point, it was, it was obvious that we had to modify the, the host substantially in order to support that, to support running at EL2. But the most important limitation in my opinion, it, has, it is that this EL2 is entirely optional. I mean, uh, a CPU implementer can simply choose not to implement virtualization for that particular CPU. So that practically means that if you want the, the host to run at EL2, we have to maintain two different versions of the FreeBSD kernel. One version that is designed to run at tier 1 and one version that is designed to run at tier, at tier 2. Unfortunately, it does not be really feasible. So the, the natural conclusion was that the host must continue to run at tier 1. And this is the architecture of the hypervisor. Uh, to the left, we have the host and to the right, we have the virtual machine. Uh, as you notice, both the host kernel and the virtual machine kernel execute at the same CPU execution, execution mode. They both execute at EL1. Our, our hypervisor is a kernel module called DMM, and, and it is forced to execute code across two different CPU execution modes. It execute, executes code at EL1 in order to emulate instructions, but it also has to execute code at EL2 in order to implement the transitions between a virtual machine and the host. The next challenge I faced was that I had to alternate execution between the host and the guest. I mean, it, I, I wanted to make, I mean, it is necessary to make sure that on the same physical CPU, both the host and the, both you, the same physical CPU can run both a uh, host thread or a guest thread. Obviously not at the same time, sequentially, but they, mo they, mo they both must be able to execute on the same physical CPU. The solution was fairly obvious. We needed to, to save and restore the CPU state. This is somewhat similar to how uh, an operating system can run multiple user space programs on the same CPU. So, the CPU this is the CPU state for a virtual machine. 
It includes all the general purpose registers, but it also must include other registers. It must include the system registers that are used as a tier one, because that's where the host and the guest execute. And besides that, it must also include the EL2 system register registers that control execution at the lower privilege levels. <clears throat> this is needed because we, we configure those registers differently when we run the host as opposed to when we run the guest. When we run the guest, we don't want the guest to have tax full control over the, the hardware, but when the host is running, we want the host to have full control over the machine. So the transitions between a host and a guest, or vice versa, are called world switches. These switches are executed from the guest to the host, and that's when the guest is running, and we must save the, the CPU state for the guest and install the CPU state for the host. Or they can be executed when we resume a virtual machine. At that point, we have the host running and we have to save its CPU state and restore the state for the guest that uh, the host will run. One important insight when deciding how to save the state is that we can have only one host CPU thread running on, uh, on the physical CPU, but we can have multiple virtual CPUs running on that CPU. So we have decided to use the EL2 stack for saving the host CPU state but for the virtual CPUs, we use a C-struct called struct hip, hip context. Uh, this is part of the virtual machine context, and it is met, managed by the, by the hypervisor. Next challenge is that the host must be able to execute privileged instructions on behalf of the guest. So we need this, because we want to respect public and Goldberg Goldberg's fidelity requirement for virtualization, which states that, that the guest execution when running in a virtual machine must be identical to that when running on bare metal. So, the solution to this problem was to give the host access to the guest state. This is needed for two reasons. First, we want to, uh, to read that, that state in order to determine what the guest, what privilege instruction the guest was trying to execute. And then we need to be able to modify uh, the guest state uh, to emulate the successful execution of that uh, instruction. The solutions to our challenges, to the challenges that I faced, I faced so far, result in a series of requirements that uh, I, need to, I needed to fulfill in order to be able to, uh, to run the hypervisor at ER2. So my goals were to be able to execute code at ER2, obviously. And then I also had to, to share, mem to share uh, memory with the host running at ER1. First of all, we need a way to switch CPU execution mode from ER1, where, where the host kernel is executing, to ER2. Uh, this is done by using a special assembly instruction called ABC and we have created a wrapper over that, uh, over that instruction. <clears throat> so when, uh, uh, when the host uh, issues that instruction, an exception occurs, and that uh, exception is taken to 3L2. That means that we need to install our, our own exception vector table in order to successfully treat, uh, treat that exception. And uh, uh, we do that at boot time, meaning that uh, the bootloader must release the kernel at ER2. After the bootloader releases the kernel at ER2, we install our own exception virtual table, and then we drop back to ER1, and the kernel boots uh, as it did before, as if it started at ER1. Next, we need a way to access the code that we want to execute at ER2. When the VML module is loaded, uh, the, the module code and data is copied in the, in the kernel address space. That, that is the year one address space. And we wanted to, to access the same address space, I mean the same code which is mapped in the year one address space in the year two address space. And the last thing we needed was uh, a way to specify what code to execute. Uh, we, we do this by following 
the convention that the first argument of the ABC instruction wrapper is a pointer to the function that uh, we want to execute at uh, year two. So this is how the resulting address spaces look like. Uh, to the left, here, we have the year zero and year one address space. This is the user space and the kernel address space. In the middle, we have the year two address space. And to the right, we have the physical memory. Then year zero and year one address space is split into two different ranges. The bottom range is the, the range that is accessible by user space. And uh, all virtual addresses that belong in this range have the most significant 15 bits or zero. <coughs> the top address range is used by the kernel, and addresses in this uh, virtual address range have the most, most significant 16 bits or one. As you can see, the ER2 virtual address range <coughs> is very similar to the user space sub range. It has the same virtual addresses meaning all addresses that have the most significant 16 bit zero, and the table format is very similar. Because of this, we're able to use <coughs> the, same the same translation tables that the kernel uses by user space. We didn't have to implement our own format for the translation tables. So like I said, we need to, to map uh, the code that is in the kernel address range, in the topmost address range, in the year 2 address range. And this is how we do it. We have split the year to address range into, into two halves. The top half is used to map the kernel virtual addresses, and the bottom half is used for the identity mapping. That identity mapping <coughs> is necessary for uh, turning on the memory management unit. We need to activate the memory management unit because uh, <coughs> we want to have access to virtual addresses when running at year 2 So, at this point, I had the CPU virtualized, so I had to move on to memory virtualization. So, we need to make sure that the guest cannot access the host's memory. The guest doesn't know that it's running in a virtual machine, and it will try to access all the memory, all the physical memory it sees as available. So, we had to trick the guest into seeing another physical memory, not the real physical memory. So this, these were the two main challenges that I faced. Like I've said, the, the guest behaves like it has access to, the entire, access to the entire physical memory. If we were to give the guest access to the real physical memory, then the guest can simply corrupt the whole state. <coughs> to prevent this, the host must, must control that physical memory. The solution was to implement a hardware mechanism, which is part of the virtualization extensions. That hardware mechanism is called station translation. <clears throat> so here's how address translation works on ARM. ARM calls going from a virtual address to physical address. Station translation. Here to the left. Both the host and the guest use station translation. But when the guest is running, we activate the second stage of translation. We activate station translation. In this case, the guest physical addresses aren't used to access aren't used to access physical memory, and are called intermediate physical addresses or IPAs. These guest, these guest physical addresses are subjected to another stage of translation, station translation, and the result the resulting address is used, is actually used to access physical memory. The hypervisor controls station translation and it controls the, the mapping between an IPA and a physical address. And this is how the host is able to remain in control over the memory region that a guest can access. Uh, okay, so let's talk in more detail about how stage, two trans how stage one translation works. This is an example when using 4K pages. ARM has support for different page sizes. You can, you can have 16K pages and 64K pages. So the input for stage one translation is a virtual address at the top, and the output is a physical address at the bottom. Translation is done using a multi-level translation table. The most significant system bits of the virtual address 
I use, I, I use to identify which subrange that which address belongs to. So if all the, those bits are zero, it belongs to the user space. And if all those bits are, are one, it belongs to the kernel. The, sorry. the translation table contains a mapping between a virtual address and a physical page. In the case of 4K pages, that means to the power of 12 bytes, the least significant 12 bits of the virtual address are used as an offset in the physical page. And this leaves us with, with 36 bits, which are used for searching in the translation tables for the corresponding output address. The first three tables, on entering the first three tables, uh, contains the address for the next level table. And the level, <coughs> the level three table contains the address for the actual physical page that, that uh, we're searching for. One interesting thing here is that the output address has a variable size, meaning that our implementers are free to, to choose the size of the physical address that is available to that, to, to that CPU. Uh, for example, on the, on the foundation plan for simulator, uh, the physical address is 40 bits wide, which is, which is a lot less than the virtual address, which is, which is always 64 bits. And here's how spatial translation looks like when we're using 4K pages. Uh, like I said earlier, the input is an intermediate physical address, which has the same size as the physical address, meaning that it actually varies in size, but it's usually smaller than the virtual address. Because it's, uh, it, it is usually smaller than, than a virtual address, like I said, in the case of the foundation platform simulator, it has 40 bits as opposed to 64. ARM has chosen to implement only three tables for the stage two tables. And as a very fortunate side effect, side effect, sorry, address translation is, is faster, it's slightly faster when using stage, stage two translation. The level one table, has, uh, has a variable size because the input address also varies in size. So in the case of, of 40 bits, uh, the level one table doesn't resolve 10 bits like before, like with station translation, but it resolves 10 bits of the uh, virtual address. This means that in our case, the level one table is twice, uh, twice as large as the, level one the corresponding level one table in stage one translation. So this is the differences I've identified so far between stage one and stage two translation. Stage, stage two has only three tables, as opposed to the four tables that stage one has. And because of this, stage two stacks are the level one table and not at the level zero table. And finally, stage two has a variable table one size to account for the fact that the input address now varies in size. Now let's look at a page descriptor. Page descriptor is the entry in the last level table, which points to the physical address that it associated with the input virtual address. At the top, we have a page descriptor for stage one, and at the bottom, a page descriptor for stage two. I've highlighted the differences uh, in pink. So because stage one page descriptors are used by both user space and kernel space, there are two bits that control the, the execution permissions. These are bits 54 and 53. Bit 54 is unprivileged, unprivileged execute never or UXN and uh, controls execution from user space. And bit 53 is privileged execute never, which controls execution from the kernel space. Because stage two is only used in one context, it's used in the context of virtual machine, it has only one bit that controls execution. That's bit 54 bit extend or execute never. Uh, another difference is in the lower bits, more specifically in, in bit 11. That bit is the non global bit, meaning that when that bit is zero, that page descriptor can be cached in the transition request buffer and used by all processes, not just that process which has, which has this entry in its translation table. And the final difference is in the memory attributes. Uh, memory attribute describe, describe the memory that uh, the page entry points to. It describes 
I mean, it tells if the, if the memory is a, is a device memory, if it's cacheable, it says if it's uh, writable, readable, and so on. So this is our final difference, final important difference between stage one and stage two. They have different format for the page table entries. And because of all these differences, I have to implement a new translation table format, which is used by uh, spatial translations. Translation, sorry. Uh, the, at the moment, the, the case memory, memory is wired, and I only implement only a small number of functions for the spatial ta tables. More specifically, I implemented only creation and destruction. Uh, that's an example of how adding an entry to the table uh, looks like now. So I had I, I wanted to reuse uh, existing functions, existing functions in PMAT, PMAT but I had to find a way to distinguish between uh, a translation table that is used by stage one or a translation table which is used by stage two. So I created an enum which holds a type, and that type is stored in a, in a member in Stru PMAP. Uh, Stru PMAP is the machine dependent machine dependent representation of the translation tables. Okay, so let's see how, uh, now, that, now that we know how memory virtualization works, let's see how uh, the guest address space, the guest physical memory, looks like when we use behind block. And in this example, uh, we define the guest memory to start at the address 1000 hex, and that guest memory is 120 megabytes in size. And this is how the guest sees its uh, memory space. As far as the guest is concerned, the memory that uh, the guest can access starts at 1000 hex. The kernel image is copied there at the beginning. And the entire memory is from 1000 hex to 138 megabytes. So all valid IPAs that the guest generates are in this address range. <coughs> then those IPAs are subjected to stage 2 translation. And that results in an uh, in address in, uh, in physical memory. And that mapping between the IPA and the physical address is controlled by the host. <clears throat> I said that earlier that Vivian console is an inter interesting example of how memory virtualization works. So in this example, we activate uh, the Vivian console using the dash p now. Vivian console works by exploiting what happens when a guest intermediate physical address is a map in the station table. Uh, in this case, when the guest tries to access a guest physical address which isn't mapped in the tables, a special exception <coughs> is, uh, is created, a special exception occurs, and that is taken to the hypervisor. This exception is called the data, data board. Then the hypervisor will forward that exception to, to user space, which will emulate the VVM console. So, when the guest tries to write to, to the BVM console device, it will write to the BVM console port. This is a map in the station tables. A data board occurs, and the hypervisor will forward that exception to user space, to the beehive process. And then the beehive process will inspect the state of the virtual machine, and will simply print the character that uh, the guest was trying to print using the console. When it comes to reading from the console, the guest driver for, for Vivian console tries to read from them that address from Vivian console port uh, four times a second. Each time it tries to read from that address, a data board occurs. That data board is taken to the, to the host, to the hypervisor. Hypervisor forwards the information associated with the exception to the beehive process. And then if the beehive process has a character buffer, it will modify the guest state and put that character in the register that the guest specified as a destination for the, for the read instruction. OK, so that was how CPU and memory virtualization uh, work on behalf of 64. Now I'd like to talk about uh, my plans for the future regarding the hypervisor. So my main goal is to merge behalf of 64 into the FreePSD code base. <clears throat> for this, I plan to follow three different directions. First, I'd like to split behind for ACP6 into machine-dependent and machine-dependent code. 
then I think uh, both the user space and the heart of Wiser could benefit from several improvements. And finally, I think we have 64 who stand to benefit from better validation. Okay, so when uh, RB7 was under review, like Mihai mentioned, one of the main uh, issues raised was that Beehive for RB7 duplicates a lot of code from uh, Beehive for A36. So by splitting uh, the Beehive code into machine independent and machine dependent, we can, we can make sure that other hypervisors, not necessarily Beehive, Beehive for ARM or ARM V8, can benefit from for the code that is common with Beehive for A36. I started with uh, uh, modifying the VVMM API. I have a patch under review. The patch is pretty old and probably needs, well, and I probably need to replace it on top of Career Master. Then I plan to, to split the uh, Beehive, Beehive Road, and Beehive Couple. And after I'm done with that, I would like to also refactor the kernel module, the VMM kernel module for Beehive for ac Like I said, the user space could stand from, to benefit from several improvements. So at the moment, we have 64 uses Merrimat Vertio. Uh, Merrimat Vertio was, was, was implemented by Mihai Darius, and it is not yet upstream. I will to switch to using Vertio PCR because that is already integrated into Beehive, and it is better tested. Uh, because of how Vivian console works, it is pretty slow. And like I said, it, it is deprecated on A76. Uh, I like to, uh, to modify Beehive to be able to emulate the DNS 16.550 UART. This is the same UART that we have Beehive for A76 emulates. And finally, I would like to have a virtual USB connected to the virtual machine in order for the user to be able to actually install uh, the FreeBSD operating system into the virtual machine instead of compiling the kernel beforehand and running that in the virtual machine. <coughs> the next big thing I plan to work on is to implement SMP support in the virtual machine. This means being able to run a virtual machine with multiple virtual CPUs. But before I, I do that, I would like to implement virtual host extensions, or VHE. This is, the, this is a new extension to the virtualization extensions that's, that was introduced in RDA.1, and uh, it is designed specifically for type of hypervisors like Beehive, like Beehive, I mean, like Beehive 164. So this is the virtualization model present in RDA.0 and RD7. This is the virtualization model that Beehive 164 implements and uh, which I described so far. As far as I'm concerned, it has two major disadvantages. The first is that in order to, to do a world switch between a guest and the host, or vice versa, we need to do a context switch from EL1 to EL2, and then another context switch from EL2 to EL1, which, is, which means a lot of overhead. The second important disadvantage is that because the VMM module needs to run across two different CPU execution modes. It needs to run at EL1 and at EL2. This adds a significant amount of complexity to hard writer. And this is a virtualization model present in RV8.1. As you might notice, the host kernel doesn't run at EL1 anymore, but it is able to run at EL2 with very minimal modifications. This means that when switching from the guest to the host, there's very little CPU state that needs to be saved. And also, because the host is now, is now running at EL2, the hypervisor can be modified to run only at EL2 instead of at EL1 and EL2, which will reduce the complexity a lot. I also like to better test the, uh, the hypervisor. I would like to use KVM tests for this. Uh, so, like the name suggests, KVM tests is a suite of tests designed to test KVM, which is also tied to hypervisor, but for Linux. And besides those tests, those tests, 
it has a very good framework for writing other tests. Uh, I have merged some patches that allow KVM test, tests to use the NS16 150 UART, which I want to emulate for BH164, and to also use the PowerState coordination interface, PSCR. So PSCR is a, a protocol designed by ARM, and this is how the guest is able to, to shut down. Because KVM test has been designed to run on the KVM, it implements the exact same boot, boot protocol as the Linux kernel. So in order to run KVM tests on the BH-164, I need to support the same boot protocol that the Linux kernel uses. The next obvious step, after I support that, is to be able to boot Linux as a guest. Okay, so now I prepared a short demo showing, showing me creating a virtual machine under BH-164, running it, and shutting it down. Uh, one thing to note is that I'm running the host on the Foundation Platform Simulator, and the simulator only works on Linux and on Windows. So now I've configured the top interface that will be used by VertelNet when running the guest. I've loaded the, uh, the kernel module. And now I'm creating a virtual machine with a base memory at that 0x8 followed by a lot of zeros. And the guest, uh, the virtual machine has 138 megabytes of memory. And now I'm running it with the block, with the virtual block device and virtual net device, and using VVM console. Okay, so the current so the guest boot into user space. It detects the virtual net device, the block device. It detects PSCI, which will be used for shutting down the virtual machine. It detects the the virtual gate, ARM Direct Controller version three, and the timer, ARM gate timer. <laughs> Uh, now I'll run a short test on the virtual machine to make sure everything works correctly. So the architecture is ARCH64, which is ARMv8. Now I'm doing ls minus, uh, minus LR. simulator is pretty slow because it emulates every instruction. It should run faster on actual hardware. Okay, that finished. I'm configuring the virtual, the virtual net interface. And now I'm pinging the host, which works. Here we have all the devices. Uh, at the top we have the VDM console, and this is the virtual block device. I'm writing the virtual block device, and I'm echoing hello world in a, in a file there. I have mounted the block device, mounted it again, and the file content is the same as the one that I have, I have uh, written there. Okay, so now I'm going to shut down the virtual machine. Okay, so that was it. That was the demo. I'd like to thank um, Mihai Karabash was the technical advisor for the project when I worked on it for my bachelor thesis. I'd also like to, to thank uh, Mihai Darius, whose implementation of Vertile MIO we have on C4 is currently using. 
And also like to thank the FreeBSD Foundation for the financial support for the for the most part of the project. So now if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Yes, please. What are the uh, current roadblocks to at least first testing on a physical device? Uh, I think the major roadblock roadblock is that I'm trying to move away from the RVA point, point zero virtualization model and to uh, to the RVA point one virtualization model, and this will take some time before it's implemented. I there, there aren't many CPUs that implement RVA point one. One of them is Thunder X two, which I hear is able to do three BSD. So. Probably the, the only roadblock is me having enough time to implement virtual host extensions and then running it on Thunder X2. Yeah. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Okay. Thank you very much for attending my presentation.